ancestry, if you want, and there's a lineage going back right from the beginning when uh, Hong Kong films made their way into the UK via uh, VHS tapes. And so um, I, I want to clarify that um, today this panel is totally independent. We're not associated with any government and we want to keep it quite friendly and open apart from the questions and answers between me and the panelists. I will also in, you know, would like to have the audience to participate um, in, in our discussion as well, as well, what the future of Hong Kong film industry could be like and where is it heading? I guess my first question for Cedric is, um, what is your favorite Hong Kong film and why? Uh, uh, I think my favorite uh, Hong Kong film uh, 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 remains uh, Chunking Express by w Wong Kar Wai, um, and uh, just because it's, uh, it's just was an important film. Uh, very uh, noisy and cacophonous and uh, you know full of uh, uh, stimuli as, as it is but also very sensuous and sensual and it immediately draws you uh, into that city and you just want to be part of it um, so I think it's uh, yeah so on many levels it's uh, for me it's a very uh, um, well I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of that film it's important to me and now we have Dr. Lo joining us. Hello, Dr. Lo, welcome. I need to unmute you. I think he's mute at the moment, I have to unmute. So Dr. Lo is an influential, a very influential figure in Hong Kong's film industry, film research, acting, screenplay, and, and, and many, many sectors. He's now an honorary, honorary resident writer at Baptist University, the Academy of Film, but he also holds a very, uh, uh, many positions, public positions, um, including um, advisor to the Hong Kong uh, Government Bureau in the cultural sector, committee member of the Han Hong Kong Arts Development Council, drama editor for the Hong Kong Literary Series, uh, member of the subcommittee on funding for performing arts, Home Affairs Bureau, Hong Kong, Hong Kong government, expert advisors for the, for the arts, capacity development funding scheme, Home Affairs Bureau of Hong Kong government, and many, many more positions. So welcome, Dr. Lo, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, first of all, I need to sorry for my um, uh, <laughs> late appearance because I uh, misunderstanding the time, I think, uh, I thought yeah, it will be um, uh, 9 p.m. Hong Kong time, but I don't know. Uh, it, uh, it changed uh, in summertime in uh, the UK. So um, uh, I, 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 I uh, express my sincere sorry and apology for uh, all the uh, audience members. And I, but I promise I will try, I will try my best to uh, concisely uh, state my, uh, my thoughts out so that uh, we will catch up the time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lo. Thank you very much. So I was just having a chat with Cedric early on about his favorite Hong Kong film. So maybe I should pass that question to you as well. What is your favorite Hong Kong film as a Hong Kong? film is a film from the 1950s, 1953. It is called, uh, uh, in literally, it is called uh, The Spring of a Demolished House. And why do you think that is, uh, do you, why do you think that's representative for Hong Kong well, cinema? Because, uh, well, first of all, it is, uh, it is one of the classics of the uh, most important uh, film company called the Central Union Company. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, it, is, uh, it is a production in 1953 reflecting the social situation of Hong Kong at that particular time. Uh, and so, um, and so uh, it is a time when uh, many people need to uh, live together under the same roof within uh, the same flat. 
so um, so uh, 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 a, a a house a house a flat is divided into many many rooms and uh, many families need to live in each of the room so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the problem, the challenge of living together and build a kind of community, neighborhood is uh, quite significant for the Hong Kong uh, dwellers in the 1950s. And these films uh, uh, represent that in a very artistic, uh, artistic uh, uh, level. Uh, we still, uh, I still use this film as uh, text films, a film for my Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong film uh, class and for my Chinese language cinema class. That's very interesting because Cedric just mentioned that his favorite Hong Kong film, guess which one? Chongqing Express. So I think Chongqing we, Express, yes. so we immediately have a pro no problem, but like a, interesting um, question connection. here or connection or, or connection here is that maybe a Hong Kong film for Hong Kong people, their favorite Hong Kong film is quite different from the Western audience, what they think their favorite Hong Kong film uh, is. And do you think- uh, No, 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 no. No? It is because of me. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, an old, I'm an old style person. <laughs> old fashioned and, person. And an old style person. And uh, so uh, my and of and of course I'm an uh, I'm a film student. So I will look at film uh, with respect to the film language, mm. the film style. And uh, and if if I'm younger, say I'm in my twenties, in my thirties, my favorite film might be otherwise might not be uh, uh, a film from the 1950s, might be a film uh, by Wong Ga Wai. Say, Wong Ga Wai's um, uh, In the Mood of Love is also one of my favorite films. Because you asked me the most favorite films, so I will, I will uh, say uh, The um, Spring in a Demolished House. But if you ask me, uh, uh, what are some of my favorite films? Uh, I will mention uh, Wong Ka Wai, and I will also mention uh, uh, Anne Hoy's film and Stephen Chow's. Stephen Chow's uh, 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 Spy from the Beijing is also a very significant film, significant film, uh, especially in, uh, in Hong Kong at Pleasant. And uh, up, uh, after the uh, uh, national security law is enforced. And what is happening right now in Hong Kong? What, is, what are the latest trends um, in the development of Hong Kong cinema in your view? I, well, I think uh, uh, right now, not only Hong Kong filmmakers, but uh, other sectors say the us circle the education sectors and the social work sectors all are under the national security law so um so because of that because of that uh we need to we imagine hong kong cinema with respect to the framework and how to dissolve or transcend this framework of national security law. So this is, this is uh, one uh, challenging question uh, to all the filmmakers and all the Hong Kong uh, citizens who want to say something uh, uh, honest to themselves. And how can that be reimagined? So I'm going to pa uh, pass the ball to, to Cedric as well, just um, to, to get him involved in the conversation too. What was the biggest selling point for Hong Kong cinema before? And what is the biggest selling point for Hong Kong cinema now? And what do you think will be the biggest selling point for Hong Kong cinema in the future internationally from a distributor's point of view? 
perhaps uh, maybe Sethi, uh, uh say something first. Uh, yes, I will respond later. Yeah, because uh, I I want I want uh, I I want to learn something from uh, from uh, the point of view of the outsiders. So I I would I would uh, like to listen to your opinion first. Um, yes. So, well, uh, outsider, but also insider in a sense, because uh, uh, um, because obviously we deal with you know the Hong Kong film uh, producers, so we also have an inside insights into uh, into their world and and into the Hong Kong film industry itself. But I'd say um, from a from a, from a customer from a viewer uh, point of view, I think Hong Kong films had a particular aura. That you know dates back oh. from the uh, uh, 70s, really 70s, 80s. The Shaw Brothers films with Bruce Lee, of course, and quickly followed with a um, you know a John Hu film. That whole style of the of the Hong Kong crime thriller and mm. the Hong Kong uh, uh, cop action film. Um, mm. Whether it's John Hu, whether it's T Stanley Tong with you know uh, Jackie Chan film, po Poly Story. So on. But I think at the heart of it, there was a, a, an identity of the Hong Kong film, which is quite cool. And in a way, in an aesthetic that maybe was originally interestingly borrowed from French film of the 60s and 70s. You, you, you know, for example, John mm. Hu was a big fan of uh, Jean-Pierre Melville films. Yes, yes. And... Uh, and and the samurai as well and so the, the all this aspect of the sort of like the uh urban madness uh uh slightly dystopian and where all sorts of people live and interact and bad things happen and it's very it's a dangerous place but it's also very exciting at the same time uh i think that defined what a hong kong cinema was uh, at uh at the time, and of course the uh, the martial arts side, brought by Bruce Lee, so there was a lot of uh, so I think this was the identity of of Hong Hong Kong film. If I would say, if I would describe it in one word, it's probably exciting. You know, Hong Kong film exciting. were exciting, and cool, and, and cool, cool. Okay. And, and that epi the, the the cool I think reached its epitome with 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 Wong Kar Wai films, and I think mm. probably. Uh, in the mood for love is the coolest that you know Hong Kong has ever been, and and mm. and could ever be maybe, uh, and I think cool because you know it, it inspired all the filmmakers around the world, uh, outside of Hong Kong. It's inspired uh, people to join the film industry to make films a, a certain way. I mean, I re remember when I was at film school uh, during that time. So uh, post post of Wong Kar Wai key years, uh, about tw 20 years ago, every, every, everybody wanted to make films like Wong Kar Wai. That kind of, you know, spontaneous can-do attitude to uh, uh, make the most of your uh, short uh, shooting time and uh, uh, location and resources in a very inventive way, like Wong Kar Wai mm -hmm. did. And, you know, because Chunking Express itself, where the film is shot, Without much you know, of a script, a very short time, yeah. With a very short time, without yeah. much of a script, an ID. He was editing another film, Ashes of Time, which was a Wuxia film, Wuxia film, and and it just made you know Shanking Press based on basically the the idea of a character, uh, and the location, and that's about it. And I think that that style of filmmaking is inc incredibly fresh and attractive, and it's really reminiscent of um, new wave cinema, in a way. In in Europe, in Europe mm -hmm. and in France, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that's for me what Hong Kong cinema meant. So <clears throat> cool in one way, artistically as well, but also uh, cool in the general sense, as in you know John Hu films were cool because of the action. The action films were 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 cool. The police films were were cool uh, um, because of the great. Directors are associated with uh, action in Hong Kong. Um, I think that really identified Hong Kong cinema. Mm. Exciting, um, ex exciting, cool, uh, mm. cool, and exciting action. Mm. Uh, I would say that uh, from uh, 
native Hong Kong citizens' perspective, uh, as well as uh, uh, Chinese language cinema scholars, I think uh, we imagining Hong Kong cinema must uh, need a key word. And that key word is we invention. We invention with a historical perspective. So I will, I will say something like in the 1950s, actually uh, the Chinese, the Cantonese operatic films has a, a, a large market in Hong Kong, as well as in Southeast Asia and occasionally in mainland China. Uh, uh, so uh, that sauna, uh, Cantonese operatic films, is a, what we call a, a lost sauna. We do not, we do not have that sauna uh, in the 80s. Uh, not in the 90s and not now, but in the 50s and in the 60s until mid 60s, it is uh, most important uh, cinematic sauna. It has a large market and aesthetically and artistically, it employ almost like um, all the uh, imagination of the uh, Cantonese filmmakers during that time. And in fact, the first uh, color films made in the 1950s are Cantonese operatic films. And, uh, and, and so for those Cantonese operatic filmmakers, they will uh, invest big money on the technology. So this is uh, one, one very significant, significant uh, point that I want to uh, bring out, bring to the attention to the international, international audience. So, uh, so uh, one, what we call cultural logic, cultural logic of why a sauna is popular is because the people feel at home with that genre. Uh, the, the people when watching those, uh, that particular genre feel comfortable and feel uh, self-strengthening. So uh, the Hong Kong film audience while watching the Cantonese operatic films, they feel very at home. They think that they belongs to a community. That is also the uh, cultural logic of Bruce Lee's films in the 70s. Bruce Lee's films, why Bruce Lee become a, a hero of the uh, martial art uh, genre? Because uh, in the early 70s, his martial arts, his martial arts uh, not only give uh, uh, the eye-catching um, uh, uh, momentum and energy to local audience, but to international audience as well. But mind you, for the Hong Kong, Hong Kong film audience, we know Bruce Lee very well. Because Bruce Lee used to be a child actor when he is a boy. <laughs> we all know that. So, um, so the, film, the film audience, while they are watching Bruce Lee, they will think about Bruce Lee is the son of our Hong Kong people, son of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So the concept, the idea of son of Hong Kong make Bruce Lee a uh, no co hero besides his martial art technique. So, so I think, I think uh, uh, in the 70s, when the Chinese 
the Chinese people all around the world, like the mainland China people, uh, the Taiwan Chinese, the Hong Kong Chinese, then the overseas Chinese, all are badly needed to have the sense of Chineseness, who we are being Chinese, and Bruce Lee's uh, film, give them chance to immediately to have that sense of Chineseness. So when we watch the uh, Fist of Fury, Fist of Fury uh, by Bruce, uh, of Bruce Lee, when Bruce Lee uh, um, uh, go to the Japanese martial arts school and uh, and knock down all the all the people there, all the Japanese there, and uh, and uh, um, walk by uh, uh, walk by a garden and look at the uh, the uh, the notice on the wall on the gate of the garden saying that Chinese and dog are not allowed. Bruce Lee's anguish is the entire Chinese people's anguish. And Bruce Lee used uh, his neck to, to uh, kick, uh, to kick, to tear down, to tear down the, uh, the, um, the notice immediately. Mm. And that, is that is a, a most striking moment in the Chinese cinema of the 70s. That moment is, I, I would say, a community building, bounding movement, uh, moment. So uh, if you ask me how to imagine the future of Hong Kong film, I would say, when some works, some production can arouse the sense of community, uh, being Hong Kong citizens or being Chinese uh, nation, Chinese uh, 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 having certain uh, Chineseness, then the film will have uh, what we call life. Uh, and will go fast in history and maybe in go wide because right now there are many there are many Chinese all over the world and there are many Hong Kong people all over the world or I would say there are many people all over the world has the concern on Hong Kong's fate so uh, if you ask me the future of Hong Kong films, I think um, it relies on whether the filmmakers can get some subject matter and get some uh, 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 film uh, style genre to foreground that uh, Chinese-ness and community of Hong Kong people. Yes. That's very interesting, Dr. Lo, because I think Cedric must, must have some experience in this as well. As, as we have, is, have seen, uh, many um, more and more mainland Chinese film are um, you know, coming out with very big budget and they also try to foreground a sense of uh, nationality, national identity of, of Chinese. But these kind of film, they, they do very well in mainland box office, but they don't necessarily connect with or communicate that well with uh, the overseas Chinese community because it's something that they don't really uh, understand they ne not necessarily have the bringing up experience to understand that kind of culture so let's say my country my people and uh, uh, it was a really good example so this film might not speak to the overseas uh, Chinese community but whereas Bruce Lee it speaks to all Chinese communities it speaks to mainland Chinese because of the moment when he was trying to fight against the Japanese it was it was nationalistic in itself in that moment but but also the character Bruce, Lee, Bruce Lee's character speaks to other Chinese community, not necessarily mainland Chinese, but you know Chinese around the world as well. So, Cedric, do you think that could be the possibility for a Hong Kong film that 
create a new uh, community identity that's not necessarily similar to what uh, mainland Chinese films are doing, but an, like an icon, a, an identity that can connect, um, you know, Chinese overseas, uh, overseas Chinese together, or to speak to them in, in that way. Well, uh, I, I think films from all over the world, and, and we don't, we, we uh, because we haven't really only, you know, uh, Hong Kong films or, China, or, or Chinese films, before we release all sorts of films. And I tend to see that uh, films that work the most around the world are films that can be, in a sense, very local. So expressing yes. that there's part of a com community and a world that is, you know, steeped into its own customs and issues, but at the same time is understandable everywhere because it's got a u u universal message in it that can be understood. Yeah. And I think a lot of what Hong Kong is doing now is probably not doing that because they're doing films that you know try to be big at the Chinese box office because this is if has this has become the business reality or the business plan if you want is to make films that can you know cost uh, tens of millions of dollars and can potentially make hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, uh, which is a luxury that they never had before. Because yes, of course, they, they could have success overseas and, uh, and they had a strong home market. But, and beyond the home market, they had a brand. Uh, but they could never achieve that kind of quick, immense results, box office, that they potentially can now. So, and with their eyes squarely on the you know, Chinese box office, of course, they have to look at stories that can work in China, spe specifically, uh, go to China, not just for the home market, uh, and, if, and, if, and, and for fans, you know, uh, overseas or at festivals. And I think that's a, uh, that's a di difficulty in a way, which is not dissimilar, if you think about it, to what the American independent industry is. Yes, um, because they also, uh, at least when when filmmakers start to have a lot of success, they you know all of a sudden they 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 confronted with the idea that they can okay have a chance at the larger box office, which is why uh, you know uh, uh, very quickly a Chloe Zhao can be drafted from uh, uh, making a, a artistic film and pr winning BAFTAs and uh, Academy Awards for I mean, Academy Awards we hope or we think for Nomadland to uh, making Avengers and she's made Avengers even before she's uh, released no, no Madeleine. So I think the, the trajectory is a bit the same. So, uh, so I understand why, you know, Hong Kong filmmakers want to make uh, bigger films, but of course, then it, it sort of um, robs Hong Kong, if you want, of its more um, community and uh, inward looking films. Actually, um, uh, this question is quite philosophical. Uh, uh, particularity and universality, and actually, uh, uh, because I'm a I'm a, a teacher, I'm a film educator, so I will I will not I will not uh, teach my uh, students how to make genre films. I would not. I I would not teach them to do that. I would. Uh, I would uh, educate them to uh, look uh, within themselves and try to see what uh, do they want to say, what to want to express, and want to share with others. Zona come after that. If you only think of zona then you might produce a work with a very uh, attractive, apparently attractive style, but without any substantive things to say. So I will, I will, uh, I will emphasize on uh, the message aspect first and try to develop the dramaturgy of the message uh, with reference to the cinematic language. So this is my pedagogy. Uh, this pedagogy 
has several uh, advantages. The first advantages, the first advantage is that it will it will have generation of young men and women having the enthusiasm to continue imagine film, imagine story, constructing stories that they like, uh, expressing messages that they want to share with others. Very important sense because you supply the film industry with generation of new blood. Yeah, without new blood, our industry will not sustain. So, uh, a new blood for film for film means new creator, new new uh, new person who want to say something uh, by making films. Okay, so this is one uh, advantage. The second advantage is that. Um, they, they will, they will try their very best by all the economic means to uh, get the message through. And this technique is not only a technique of film production. This technique is uh, artistic, artistic. Uh, production against the hostile uh, capitalistic environment, I should say. So if, if my student can use very small budget and produce a firm that can make uh, break even, first of all, and then make some money, then it means that my student can continue producing films. Because the, the graduate, the new graduate, the fresh graduate of, uh, from the film school cannot have chance making large budget film. But if they can make small budget film and break even, it means that they will have chances to continue making films. So first of all, uh, provide an environment for creating new blood. And secondly, allowing them to equip themselves with the necessary technique to having the chance to continue, continue making films. So this is uh, the second advantage. And with with the uh, with the uh, uh, the previous two advantage, then we can have uh, a probability to having good works uh, frequently, more frequently, and one two good work from the younger generation will immediately stir up the creative environment. That is the case in the recent three, five years in Hong Kong. We see a clusters of younger film directors. They produce small budget film and earn some money, earn some money. The box office are quite good. Not, not as good as the Stephen Chow's film, but not bad. Uh, when while Stephen Chow's films can earn uh, um, uh, five uh, uh, five hundred million, uh, fifty million, fifty million, uh, the low budget uh, young filmmakers' films can have uh, ten million. 20 million, but the budget of the young filmmakers productions is relatively small, so they can earn big money. And because of that, new investor 
have interest supporting these generation of new young filmmakers. And that is my way of we imagining uh, uh, future Hong Kong film production with respect to the cultural economy. So to summarize that, possibly we need to feedback to some of the Hong Kong film companies say maybe they should start looking at smaller budget film rather than uh, having a high expectation from uh, the box office from mainland China in return to have capital investment. So maybe smaller and more independent production could work as well. And they could potentially have the, have the um, ability to travel abroad, not just for Hong Kong. Yes, this is my this is my theory, uh, and actually this, this theory this theory has a, a financial concern as well, because during during a, a economic crisis, big company will collapse, but a small enterprise will survive. Uh, uh, the the hawkers on the street will always survive a uh, difficult mm -hmm. time. Yeah, because, because uh, the capital uh, inventory, the investment is low. So uh, it can survive uh, the challenge of financial difficulty. So uh, that is my theory. And uh, that theory uh, seems uh, correct <laughs> looking from the past 10 years situation. That's quite interesting. I mean, I think something about Hong Kong cinema is that it's always been inventive, as you said before, or, or may, maybe you might say that, but it's about inventiveness. And I was just a uh, uh, reminder that, you know, pretty much from the start, and even, even the John Woo films, let's say, or some of the best action films, were very inventive in the way they were shot, they were very efficient with that typical Hong Kong, you know, notion of strive and graft and making things happen by any means uh, and that really i think is uh, infectious as well that's that's kind of still yes, making infectious. infectious good work good work in, in itself but also to others and i i i, I remember john who was talking about when he was uh, editing the his film after the killer he received a letter and his editor had been working for 10 days non-stop without a break and 10 nights and uh, and they were at the end of it, and 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 they suddenly received a letter from Martin Scorsese, a long letter about how he loved the killer and the whole church scene yeah. and the Virgin Mary exploding, and and that gave them the necessary stimulus to go and finish editing the film and make it, and I think that that's very much to the that is what is infection about infectious about Hong Kong itself, that sense of energy. Yeah. and uh, can do that no matter what, we can make some, something here. Um, uh, but I have to say, it's what I think is encouraging with some of the companies in Hong Kong is that they, I don't know if they are, there's a willingness to maybe do that, as in they are making the big budget films or trying to that will, you know, make money at the Chinese box office. But at the same time, they are also uh, trying to finance, or uh, not just trying, is actually making lower budget, maybe for one million dollar or even less films, uh, to give new filmmakers a chance or to shoot more lo lo local stories, uh, and a lot of the bigger production codes in Hong Kong have started to do that. You know, I'm, 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 yes. one, uh, one example is uh, the one set up by Louis Ku, you know, the famous uh, actor yes, in, yes. in Hong Kong, one one cool pictures which, you know, on one hand is doing like uh, $40 million sci-fi projects, but on the other is doing a, a lockdown story, All You Need in Love, which was shot in about three weeks in a small lo location. Uh, I think that's a film that, that's going to be launched soon. Um, so I think there's still this um, drive to make mm. that film. And maybe there's an awareness now that has been missing in the last few years, that they do need to, to be making these films as well. Similar case uh, is uh, Andy Lau. Andy Lau's support uh, 
of uh, to food chain. Food yeah. chain's production uh, made in Hong Kong, uh, get the support from uh, Andy Lau, and, and then food chain's uh, career uh, has a quick jump, quick lead. So, so this kind of uh, support of low budget firm for uh, younger or new blood is quite significant, especially during a time of uncertainty, politically and economically. So Cedric, yeah. I think you have something to announce as well during, the, uh, during this panel for a new distribution of Hong Kong film uh, or release of a Hong Kong film in the UK. So should well, I leave that to you? And then we can open up to the floor to the audience. I think uh, well, it's, 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 it's quite interesting because we have a film that is very Hong Kong and homegrown, but that also has, uh, uh, has done very well at uh, the box office in China, uh, and in fact, is 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 an Andy Lau film. So uh, I'm I'm very pleased to announce that we we will bring Shockwave two to the UK uh, very soon. Uh, and Shockwave two was the most successful, you know, Hong Kong film of uh, of last year, and and for a while, and and I think it did uh, uh, more than two hundred million dollars at the Chinese box office. Uh, but uh, it's a Herman Yao film. Uh, it's a sequel to the first shockwave, but actually, it doesn't. Uh, you you don't need to have seen the first one to uh, uh, see this one. It's a, it's a thematic sequel, but it's not a, a it's not a narrative sequel. And okay. uh, uh, and it's a very interesting film for me because it does address some of the Hong Kong themes right now and situation, but it does it in a very uh, 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 you know what Scorsese called the smugglers film way is that it ties it into a genre film and it's for you to sort of work out what the themes are and what the narrative, uh, what the, you know, broader perspective on, on the narrative can, can, can be. Uh, and also it's a terrific action film, uh, um, thriller, action thriller. So we are, we are very pleased about that and, uh, um, you know, uh, I hope that um, this year also sees the, uh, uh, another film like Hong Shockwave 2 in Hong, Hong Kong. So if I may, I'm going to share the trailer with everyone just so that um, we can have a break um, between now and the audience um, questions. I know we are friends. Tell me who I am. I saw my girl in Ready? Ready. 你想知道哪一個? 你炸斷腳之後我知道你一直都想做警察他牽涉中四十八個人的爆炸案現在是痛側反身上有牆其實你是CTRU的卧底 可不可以繼續你的任務? 我會繼續你給我的任務。So I'm going to open open the question to the audience now following that trailer. The, the, the film is much more interesting than that though than the action because it's about whether you destroy Hong Kong or you rebuild it or what is the identity is he a police or is he a, is he a criminal you know building up from um, in, in further affairs yeah is, is he an informer is he a, is he a, is he a true uh, lover of the city or is he acting is he a foreign agent and how is he There's going to love the city does he love yeah. the city by destroying it by you know building a massive bomb to destroy the city 
city or the city does it love the city by saving it so that's the end that i'm not going to um, review at the moment so at the moment i would like to invite all the audience to participate in a lively discussion what do you want to see for the next hong kong film what do you expect in the next 10 years coming out from hong kong this very unique um, city and region Please feel free to open your, um, turn on your camera and, and your microphone. If you have anything to add, I'm going to maybe ask Olivia if he's still there. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there, and, uh, and uh, first I, I want to thank you, and I want to uh, uh, to thank Dr. Lau and, and Cedric Merci uh, for for their insight and um, and their views on on Hong Kong cinema. Uh, I'm 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 not sure I'm the best place to uh, uh, to have a strong opinion <laughs> about Hong Kong cinema. It's it's still very very. Uh, I'm still getting familiar with it, uh, so I'm very much here to uh, to learn and and observe and and and, and see what uh, um, what what the trends and the hopes are uh, for the future. Um, but I've been learning quite a, quite quite a bit, uh, I must say. What do you want to see, though, personally? This is not a professional. This is totally I, personal. Personal. What, what, what my a question that I have, perhaps, is, and we've just seen that excerpt, um, you know, typical action movie, modern, etc. Um, I'm. I would like to know to what extent um, Hong Kong cinema has to happen in Hong Kong, or. Can, can there be a Hong Kong cinema that is produced internationally, that can be produced in Europe, for instance, and still be called Hong Kong cinema? Uh, is there compatibility uh, or, or is that, or does Hong Kong cinema have to happen uh, either in Hong Kong or in Asia? Well, that's the thing that Cedric and I have been talking a lot, quite a lot. What do you think, Cedric? I was on mute. Uh, I think it's probably the contrary. I think there can be a Hong Kong cinema that is shot in Hong Kong, but not necessarily uh, <laughs> by Hong Kong pro producers, as in you know French or English or, or, so, or, or so forth, because they want to capture some of that specific Hong Kongness. Whether they can devise stories that uh, resonate in Hong Kong is another story. Um, but I think. Uh, one of the things about Hong Kong, uh, it's one of the few, not the few, but it's it's a place that you know definitely lends itself very well to film and has a, a very strong kinetic identity. Um, you just show it in you just see it in the trailer that we've just seen. You you see that that scene and that harbor and says okay you you immediately know it's Hong Kong, you know, and there are very few places. Uh, in the film where, where you where you you can do do that so it's, it's got this identity like you know new york has let's say or uh, maybe london has uh, Paris has some of the big cities but it's got that and immediately you think you know all sorts of images can can drew up in your mind uh, about actors and uh, uh, certain visual re references about you know the the, the vertical city is a city that truly never sleeps um, and I think you know it's impossible to make a film, a Hong Kong film, without uh, having the city in it for me because it is a character, like uh, New York films are. It's a character in itself. I think uh, I think uh, whether Hong Kong is a place. Uh, is this uh, it does is the subject matter of the film is not uh, is not a must but the character especially uh, the personality the uh, adaptiveness of the of the uh, of the uh, 
protagonist involved, the people involved in the narrative is important. So if, if this is a story about uh, people living in Hong Kong, uh, their way of doing things are uh, as what we uh, uh, know about Hong Kong people uh, used to be doing things in this way, then it, it is, of course, a Hong Kong firm. But if it is a firm uh, 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 happen or located in, say, uh, in the UK, but uh, it is a firm between uh, uh, Hong, uh, Hong Kong immigrant with a uh, foreigner, then it might still be a Hong Kong firm if it, win, if it involve certain uh, way of doing things that uh, will be uh, the characteristics of Hong Kong people. And that characteristic is cultural characteristic, which is very important. Because cultural characteristic is something that defined a people and a culture. Just like uh, I, I, have, I have written a paper on, uh, on Anne Lee's Brookbred Mountain. And I say Brookbed Mountain is a very good example to illustrate the traditional Chinese aesthetic concept of aura, aura, spirit, okay, in a way, aura, aesthetic aura. And and I I I try to I try to not I try to I used I used the uh, the film segment. The, the rhythm, the montage, uh, the mise en scene, and the pawn sequence uh, camera movement of the film, Book Red Mountain, to illustrate how they are in tune with the tra traditional Chinese aesthetic concept of aura. And uh, I think I'm successful because I presented the paper in a conference and the audience uh, accept that immediately. Brookbred Mountain is not, is not a story about Chinese people. It is a story between two Americans in the 60s. But the director, An Ni, is a Chinese director. And he subtly utilized some aesthetic that can be recognized and analyzed as Chinese aesthetic. So similarly, even though in the future, we might produce films involving all uh, people from all around the world without any Chinese, but the film language, the style might be recognized as uh, Hong Kong cinema style or Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong film language. That is my, that is my guess. So if we can successfully, successfully uh, create that, it means that our subject matter, Hong Kong cinema subject matter, Hong Kong film subject matter is larger than Hong Kong citizen, Hong Kong, the city and Hong Kong people. So this is my understanding. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, it is a matter of firm language, cultural characteristic, and uh, uh, way of doing things, way of imagine our future. Any, and thank you for your contribution, Olivia. Any other, any other um, comments or? contribution from the audience. We have a question uh, from Bruce saying that, shall we say the future of Hong Kong cinema lies in independent cinema in terms of both production mode and aesthetics? It is interesting that many small budget films in, the, in Hong Kong are supported by government funding now. So is that the way to go forward, do you think? Going smaller budgets and smaller production? 
Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think as we discussed before, the, uh, it, it sums up well um, the the style and the essence of uh, Hong, 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 Hong Kong cinema, which and, and that's why I linked it to the new wave uh, uh, because it's its way of doing things spontaneously and inventively uh, on the cheap, in a way, and to finding um, uh, aesthetic an aesthetic mode within that, um, and I think. That's that's probably that, that's what made Hong, Hong Kong cinema, uh, and pro, pro, potentially what will save it again. Yes, it's the spirit, there's the spirit behind it. I totally um, agree, and it's a. I think it's Hong Kong cinema is a feeling. It's it's a feeling. It's a style. It's a style, and it's an attitude towards life as well. It's not necessarily about Hong Kong people. It just happened that the story take place in Hong Kong, but I think it's the mentality of the people, and especially. The mentality of never giving up and trying their best doesn't matter what environment, what circumstance that they're living in, that they even within the characters themselves, you know, they try to make a life, and it's a, I think it's a mentality of survival that makes Hong Kong mm. films quite unique. You know, just the feeling of it. If I if good I can't survival survival survival, I think it's a mentality word. of survival, and doesn't matter, and being flexible as well, being flexible. So it, it doesn't have to be about a Hong Kong, you know, a Hong Kong er. It's not about being a Hong Kong er. It's just the attitude of life, an attitude yeah. when you you give it all you can, and you survive no matter what the circumstance is, because you know that you will always be okay. And Hong Kong, you know, citizens are flexible enough to face whatever whatever may come in the future, good or bad, I think. And for that feeling, sorry, Cedric, go on. <laughs> no, no, I, I just wanted to say is, I, I mean, I guess an interesting case in point about a Hong Kong film away from Hong Kong is um, one of the Wong Kar Wai films. The but that didn't work. The, the blue, the blue one shot in Argentina. But it, the blue, I know the blueberry. No, 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 no! I'm not talking about this American film. I'm talking about okay. the uh, about the one in Argentina. The the uh, um, uh, name of it escapes me. But Happy together. You, yes, exactly. Have uh, have it to to together, which was very much a Hong Kong film, but you actually don't see Hong Hong Kong at all in it. Mm. It's about uh, Hong Kong I will characters. use. I will use uh, another example, very famous example uh, in uh, contemporary film history, um, to celebrate to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Ozu. The Japanese invite <laughs> uh, Hao Xiaoxian mm. to produce a film. Mm. Mm. Why? <laughs> yeah, because they think that Hao Xiaoxian film style and also film style is within the same family more than closer than any Japanese filmmakers. So, so the question of uh, Hong Kong films outside of Hong Kong is uh, a possibility. Hong Kong films without any Chinese as uh, characters within the story is also a possibility because the nature and um, to define Hong Kong film is on the film language and cinematic style. So if we if we use this level of understanding of a film, uh, a film uh, essence, the essence of film, then we will be uh, free uh, regarding subject matter, regarding uh, production locations, and uh, even uh, money resources. I think there's also something for me which is um, interesting that. And that's a main, maybe one of the main differences which we haven't talked about till now, but between you know Hong Kong cinema and mainland China films, that Hong Kong cinema borrows a lot from you, 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 European and specifically French cinema of the fifties and sixties, and there is that sort of like uh, osmosis between you know East and West, which is very much part of the city itself, that reflects it directly in its cinema. 
uh, and which I think is probably quite unique to mm. Hong Kong and to what Hong Kong was and you know has been historically. And Sally Chan, she commented that I really like Dr. Lo's concept of Hong Kong aesthetic aura that transcends nationality. Would he class Kung Fu films in that as well? Of course, of course, yes. And uh, actually, um, actually, uh, uh, there are there are uh, three different types, three different types of uh, martial art films in uh, in the past. Uh, the Bruce Lee's type is what we call uh, uh, the hardcore martial art films. Okay. Um, uh, and then we have the short fighting, short fighting, short fighting martial art films. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, those with uh, animation with uh, a spirit, with aura uh, coming, coming through the hands, the body. And we, we classify that as, uh, as um, uh, metaphysical martial art films. Okay, so, so uh, these three different types of martial art films, of course, uh, the uh, Bruce Lee's type martial art film, cannot be reproduced, cannot be reproduced by uh, people from other countries because it belongs to Chinese Kung Fu. But, um, but actually I see uh, uh, those short fighting martial art film has certain kind of uh, mutual interplay uh, among uh, Hong Kong cinema uh, Japanese cinema and Korean cinema, uh, the, the short fighting, the short fighting uh, film. And I see some imitation uh, from Hollywood of the metaphysical martial art films. So, um, so uh, including uh, the, the Matrix, the Matrix, uh, the matrix representing uh, uh, what we call the the wire technique. Uh, borrow the wire technique from Hong Kong cinema, and become a very interesting uh, uh, cinematic language in uh, Hollywood films. So I I think uh, people uh, audience all around the world recognize all that uh, technique uh, from Hong Kong, and they will. They will, they will, uh, they will realize uh, that if this kind of technique can be uh, can be combined with a good story, then even though that story is not happened in Hong Kong, that film can also has the connection with Hong Kong people and Hong Kong culture. So, uh, so I think uh, I I can also see that Choi Huck want to do that as early as the nineteen nineties. So Choi Huck uh, 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 tried to create certain uh, uh, martial art movement choreography uh, from the perspective of uh, what I what I have mentioned combining uh, metaphysical martial art and the short fighting martial art. And actually, Choi Huck's, uh, Choi Huck's ideal uh, is accomplished subsequently by uh, some other, some other uh, uh, film, uh, uh, some other film in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, like uh, the Monkey King's films, okay, uh, achieved that. But the tie, I mean, the the uh, the trend of uh, watching martial art films uh, seems to uh, come down a little bit. Uh, we we want to see other sauna now. Uh, we we don't want to see martial art 
but we want to see action. So what kind of action should the, uh, should the contemporary taste is something that uh, I think will be um, a crucial question for the future of uh, uh, big box office film uh, um, uh, with, uh, in the short future. So, so how to create that, uh, how to create that and combine that with a good story uh, is um, uh, deserve uh, Hong Kong filmmakers creativity uh, to uh, invest upon that. Thank you very much, Dr. Lo. I think we are getting close um, to, to the end now. We've passed 10 minutes. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining today's panel. I think, let me just summarize a little bit, if we agree what we have discussed is that Hong Kong cinema should possibly look beyond uh, uh, identity or national identity, but Hong Kong cinema is flexible as its people to be um, more inclusive. And what is about Hong Kong cinema is unique, it's about its style, the film language, and that can take it to an uh, international audience. And before we, we go, I would like to show you one more trailer just to illustrate that what I was trying to say that Hong Kong cinema is about the style, it's about the feeling, and, and hopefully you will, try, you will get to see what I mean. Thank you again for joining and don't forget to support the Chinese cinema season, it's still ongoing. We have an amazing program launching Hong Kong Reimagine with latest student films from Academy of, Academy of Film, Baptist University, and some hidden gems and also Shockwave 2 as well. Thank you and have a good day.